Good morning, and welcome to a new episode of Meatpacking Unpacked, Community Connected, brought to you by the Meatpacking District. My name is Jeffrey LaFrancois, and I'm the Executive Director of the Meatpacking Business Improvement District. Today, I'm joined uh, by friends um, from a gallery just further north of us in Chelsea, Christina Maxwell, Hannah Foster, and Nicholas B. Sanchez. Christina Maxwell is the manager of the Highline Nine Galleries, a hybrid exhibition and event space located in the heart of West Chelsea and home to a wide array of experiences and art. She's experienced many facets of the art sector, sector. Maxwell is a published writer, singer, actress, and public speaker, often speaking on the importance of arts education and empathy. Hannah Foster is the head of art advisory at Sugarlift, a gallery and online marketplace that connects collectors directly with today's best emerging artists. Their mission is to help more artists create sustainable careers by finding a new audience of collectors. Since 2014, they've helped thousands of art buyers find artwork from emerging and established artists in New York City and beyond. And finally, Nicholas B. Sanchez, Nico, is a contemporary artist. He received his BFA from Kendall College of Art and Design and his MFA from the New York Academy of Art, where he was awarded the 2014 New York Academy of Art Postgraduate Fellowship. Sanchez has been selected for artists and residencies in China, the Dominican Republic, and Venice, and has been featured in many publications, including Vogue Italia, Vanity Fair, and New York Magazine. So stellar rosters all around. Thank you guys for joining us today. Really excited to have a conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so let's start, um, Hannah, Christina, the idea of the Highline Nine. Um, it's a great name, it rhymes, but what is it? <laughs> sure, a great question. So the Highline Nine, Highline comes from the fact that we're right directly under the Highline, have direct access when it's fully open. So we run along 10th Ave from 27th Street to 28th Street. It's a corridor that's open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily. And the nine comes from the fact that we have nine spaces. So it's set up almost like a European arcade model where you walk through this gorgeous corridor and on either side are nine glass walled, beautiful skylit white galleries. Gotcha. Okay, so west side of 10th Avenue between 28th and 20, 28th and 29th? Uh, the 20, 27th and 28th, but yes, 27th the west and 28th. Side. Okay, gotcha. Um, that's awesome, and you guys are open to the public right now. We are. So the individual galleries are not open, but we our passageway has remained open. Um, people walk through all the time, you know, on their way to, to and from work or to get fresh air on their way to lunch. And we have a beautiful on-site Italian restaurant that people have been coming to, especially now with outdoor dining open. But we are indeed open to the public to walk through. And when you walk through, you're able to see into all of our gallery spaces five of which are filled with artists working. You can scan the QR codes to purchase their finished art and also see them at work behind it. That's pretty awesome to have that going on right now yeah. um, and in a way that you can actually walk through and experience. Um, Hannah, how about um, in terms of what you guys are doing right now, how does this interplay um, with the Highline 9 and, and what specifically sort of has come out of this time, given everything that's going on. Whoop. We can't hear you. Now, can we get a little yes, we can. Okay, perfect. There we go. Um, sure. Yeah, so, so Sugarlift is uh, an interesting, uh, we're a little bit hard to put your finger on. We're neither a gallery or an art advisory or an online marketplace because we do all of those things. Um, and when we have in-person events, uh, those are things that we sort of do on kind of a flexible model. So we'll do temporary exhibitions uh, in spaces throughout the city, like the Highline Nine. Um, so especially, you know, with, with everything going on with the pandemic, um, I would say that the art world has been moving in a more online, flexible model, even before COVID-19 hit. Um, but especially now, you know, artists can't necessarily rely on in-person channels for sales, like art fairs, gallery exhibitions. So we really had to adapt to these new restrictions um, with Sugarlift being kind of an amalgamation of all these different uh, uh, sides of our business has been able to adapt to really well. And that's how we met and, and started working with the Highline 9. We did a exhibition that we partnered on back in January, um, which was like a blockbuster. You know, we had 700 people through the door 
we might have been a super spreader event. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but it was just a <clears throat> successful exhibition. So um, we're really kindred spirits with uh, this incredible, unique uh, art event space. So we decided to partner for the residency to sort of enliven these spaces as the city is looking to reopening, uh, to having a safe engagement between artists and the community that could happen kind of between the glass gallery walls, but it's still, um, you know, kind of a, a microcosm of what we do on the day to day, which is just to connect artists with their collectors. So I come to you and I say, I want to buy some art. Um, I like A, B, C, D. And then you have connections with the different artists and galleries that you sort of then might take me on a circuit on or make introductions to. Is that how it works kind of thing? Exactly. I'm like a matchmaker between. <laughs> so, That's great. Looking for, you know, a painting for your living room or looking to curate an entire hospital ward. Um, we, exactly that. We have a network of artists um, like Nico, like the, the other artists in the residency, and we connect them with those opportunities. And as a buyer, we help you find what you're looking for. Sure. Um, okay, Nico, the creator on, on the, the line today, what has the past five months been like for you in terms of um, what you're creating, what you're a part of, what you're seeing um, in your community? Um, I'm seeing a lot of different things in the artist community. Uh, there's a lot of artists that are affected by this, like Hannah touched on. Uh, we're not able to exhibit publicly our, our work where people can see it in person. Uh, for me, I, I normally travel a lot and I travel to different parts of the country and different parts of Europe to meet with collectors and clients and people that are interested in my work. I also offer workshops uh, periodically. And so this is definitely the, the furthest, uh, the, the longest stretch of time that I've gone without traveling uh, for work. But, um, uh, you know, I, as an artist, I already, you know, I work in my studio like by myself and sometimes with my dog. And uh, so I'm used to being a little bit more secluded and, um, you know, I can, I can still go to work uh, per se. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've, how I've, it's, I think not being able to travel has been like the biggest impact. Yeah. Um, I feel like I should just shred my United States passport because it's seemingly useless right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, what has surprised you Nico about like this moment in I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, the, inspiration we've seen um, in the meatpacking district. We did a big mural series um, across the district when some stores boarded up initially um, in March. We just saw it as a canvas and a need to put art out there because boarded up storefronts are, you know, not appealing for anybody. Um, so what surprised you? What have, what have you been seeing in terms of um, this, this moment? Um, I, I don't know what surprised me, but I think, um, what I've learned is that uh, I think there's a, a lot of artists and a lot of people trying to, that we can't help but to respond to what's going on. And um, I think for me, uh, what I've learned instead of creating art, I mean, I, I think contemporary artists are, uh, uh, I think a lot of people are, are making work about their personal experience with, with what's going on with COVID and with all these limitations, limitations and restrictions. And I think that it can feel restricting and it can feel limiting. But I think for, for me, what I've, what I've learned about myself is that <clears throat> I've, I've kind of decided to become more of myself and be and, and show more of myself through social media and kind of really just uh, hone in on what my work is about and the message I want to put out. That's a great thing. What about Christina? What about you? What sort of surprised you in this moment of in, in the art world and in what we're all living through right now? You know, I think I'll start with what hasn't surprised me is that artists have always been the group that we look to in a lot of ways um, for a glimpse at hope that there are brighter days ahead and that there are, are bigger things and that we can aspire to something better and to, to being better. And I have seen that to a whole new degree throughout this period. 
And something that has surprised me, um, two things. One, the work ethic of the five artists who are in our residency. I mean, it's extraordinary. Like one of our artists, uh, Ruben, he's in at like 7 a.m. every morning to paint in the morning light. He worked 29 days straight without a break in this space to create these four pieces. Nico, we met, we got connected with you all because Nico was working so late at night that um, someone from your organization, yeah, Tiffany walked through and, and saw him just out in the neighborhood. So just seeing, I think, the, the hunger to create is one thing that has been uh, remarkable. And our artists are creating pieces on the theme of Dare to Reimagine and imagining a city that's healed in body and spirit. And sort of like Nico said, that looks so different for each of these artists. And so what Ruben, who I mentioned, is doing with these geometric shapes that are sort of based off of the city skyline is completely different from what Nico is doing in his studio, which is these like gorgeous ballet folklorico dancers that were a product of Nico, as he said, digging deeper into himself. And I think the other thing that has really surprised me is the amount of organic connection that's happened from this. So for example, Vicky, one of our artists was painting and someone came in in a mask and just stood out of her gallery for like 30 minutes. So finally she like opened the door and she's like hot, you know, with her mask and introduced herself. And he was like, I'm a choreographer and dancer. I live here in the neighborhood. Can I dance to your art? Turns out he's Brian Brooks, who's such an illustrious choreographer, dancer, is like the resident of the Guggenheim. He comes back later on in a mask and everything, plays music, and we have, we're, we're getting a video from him dancing a, 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 an original piece while she paints on a blank canvas. That's amazing. And I, we, that's something we could have never predicted occurring. So stuff like that has been really amazing. That's fantastic. And Hannah, how about you? I mean, the art market pre-COVID was on fire. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. um, what insights do you have, especially the contemporary art market, which I feel like, you know, we read about the Picassos that sell and, um, you know, the, the at the auction houses, right? Um, and what those go for um, and the Hearst and the Basquiat and all that stuff. But in the contemporary world, it's not, you know, the Times isn't covering that. Um, so what's happening? In, in that side of the market, especially with all this creativity that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. I think there has been a great kind of paring down of the art market. You know, it's, it's a very global, um, you know, we look at kind of the intersections between Hong Kong and London and the US and these things, you know, the fairs that everybody goes to, um, which just hasn't been able to happen. So instead, I think it's been really simplified down to, you know, the creator, posting, like Nico said, on social media, just connecting um, a lot more directly, just, you know, creating the art, even if it seems like it might be in a vacuum, it's not right now. The market continues. Um, and we've seen an incredible amount of support, both from artists and collectors who want to do good in this moment, which I think um, is one of the things that surprised me the most. Not that artists want to do good. I know that's the case. They always have. Um, you know, when it comes to causes, they were some of the first to launch benefits and things like this for essential workers. Um, sure. Just the ability for people to, uh, you know, both pare down and, and kind of survive through what we see as one of the hardest downturns of the market, um, you know, the art market and beyond, um, but still create and still help other people, you know, whether it's selling their work. Uh, Nico raised... Seven thousand dollars, and I think it was it was April that you did that. Nico. Yeah, the first week of April. Yeah. Yeah, you raised seven thousand dollars for essential workers in New York, which is just incredible. When this is a time where everyone Amazing. has to kind of think about their own their own needs, when artists are still putting themselves first. Um, so it's it's definitely slowed down, but I think the need the desire is still there. You know, people still have empty walls. People still want to support artists. Artists still want to create. Um, so it, it looks a little bit different, but those connections are happening in microcosms uh, all over the U.S., I would say. That's great. Nico, what's it like having people watch you? I mean, you were in <laughs> school, right? You had colleagues next to you, but now you're sort of, you're behind the glass. There's the theatrical element to it. How does that, is that, do you think, changing your work at all? Like, is there a, um, an effect that you've noticed? Uh, <laughs> it does feel like it, it, at first it was an intimidating idea to have someone uh, to, 
to feel like uh, a fish in a fishbowl. And I think that has like a negative connotation, but um, uh, I think that initial idea was intimidating because when, uh, as a painter, for me, it's, um, it's uh, the way that I work is it's just a series of mistakes. And so for me to be, for, for that, those mistakes to be visible, I mean, I mean, imagine when you're, you know, you're trying to work something out in front of people. It's a very vulnerable feeling. But, um, uh, you know, uh, I think the, the great thing is like people like Tiffany who came in and saw my work uh, and saw me in the process of, um, I think what's awesome is that people can appreciate just the, that process. Well, what's so remarkable about what all of you are talking about right now is, you know, um, I, we run the Neighborhood Association for the Meatpacking District, and it's so we've watched so much change in the retail landscape where experience is critical and experiential retail is its own genre. And now what we're talking about here is an experiential gallery where people are interacting with art in a way that they hadn't previously. Um, Christina, would you say that this specific, like the what you're showing now came about because of COVID or was this something you guys kind of had in the works of always having our, our artists uh, at work on display? This was entirely a product of COVID. And I, a little background on me, I began the role as manager of Highline 9 in March, in mid-March. So right <laughs> when COVID hit. And so all of our programming that had been scheduled, our you know, traditional exhibitions canceled or you know, postponed indefinitely. And I was like, oh, okay, so how do we fill these galleries and like not just hang like a piece of art behind glass? Um, and so that's why I called Sugarlift because I was involved in their previous exhibition at Highline 9 and I knew they were people who thought outside of the box and we sort of brainstormed, ended up with this idea. So it was a product of COVID, but I think this is a moment in time when there's so much loss, so much turmoil, so much unknown, but it's also an opportunity with everything ripped out from underneath us. It's an opportunity to innovate and to find some things that we want to keep even after COVID. And this is something that we have learned, I mean, the response has been extraordinary. And it's something that we want to keep, is the idea of putting the spotlight on the artists and the connection between the artists and the buyer. I mean, this was my, I, my very first piece of real art is from one of our artists in residence. And the reason it's so meaningful is I know the story behind how she created it, who she created it with. And it like hit me like in my core when I saw that piece. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to, to put in underneath the spotlight. And that's something we'll definitely be continuing. Because you've started something and now you can't sort of stop it. And I think especially yeah. um, when, to your point of like seeing that creation happen um, and, and building that connection. And I mean, Sugarlift, Hannah, this is gonna give you guys a whole new um, angle of approach as well with both collectors and artists that you represent. Yeah, absolutely. You know, something that we do in, in non-pandemic lands is bring collectors on artist studio visits. And that's one of my favorite, favorite moments is when you get, you have the collector realize and remember that this is something made by a human hand, by an artist who's putting in their 10,000 plus hours. Um, you know, I think sometimes the Chelsea experience uh, has been very kind of esoteric and it's a white cube. And sometimes it can be a little intimidating to walk in and ask for a price list. And, and this is something that the average person um, I think is doing less and less nowadays, especially with the desire to, to sort of be able to online shop. Um, so this residency is just kind of blowing open every studio door that's, you know, maybe a metal door in a warehouse where you can't see behind it in Bushwick or in Harlem or in these places that um, sure. a, lot of, a lot of artists work. And it's reminding everybody that it's a real person, like Christina said, with a story uh, making the work. And we're so excited to, to have that happen kind of in the epicenter of the art world, which is Chelsea and the Meatpacking District, and, and kind of bring those experiences to this neighborhood. And I do have to jump in quickly because we also, um, now we've decided that we're gonna partner with Sugarlift on three exhibitions starting in September, whatever exhibitions you know, are allowed to look like. But it's been so wildly successful and we love the way that Sugarlift thinks that we're gonna be featuring their artists at Highline 9 for the fall. 
That's awesome. And I can just keep thinking about how I want people to come eat and shop and meet pack and get their tickets to the Highline, walk the Highline yes. to 23rd Street, <laughs> and then they can go visit you guys at Highline 9. Um, it's sounds perfect. perfect. <laughs> um, Nico, what's your, the total little bit of subject change, what's your earliest memory of like wanting to create something, wanting to do mm. some art? Um, <laughs> when did you put a, was it a paintbrush to paper? Was it a pencil to paper? Um, um, what do you recall? Um, I actually do recall when I was really young, my dad taught me how to draw, uh, he taught um, me and my two brothers uh, how to draw. And so we were drawing ever since we were kids. I was drawing ever since I was like four or five. I mean, I would I would draw dinosaurs. I mean, what I mean, what else are we supposed to draw? What do we right, what do we know kid. other than just like <laughs> you know? No, I was drawing Rembrandt studies. No, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, of course. Uh, no, I um, you know that that's those are some like early childhood creations. But um, I think all throughout my uh, progression of becoming and more and more of uh, of someone who has to paint and draw there's always been new moments that have kind of uh, turned into these kind of realizations of like, Oh, these are my, these are my aspirations. Oh, these are the things that I feel like I have to do in order to, or to make me feel like I'm breathing. So, you know, it, it, at certain points I, I learned new skill set that kind of allows me to communicate a different way. And then, and then once I do that and I put that out into the world, it, um, it turns into, oh, now I have a different motivation. Uh, now that I know that this, this new world is accessible to me um, and, and is accepting my work, uh, what I put out. So I think all throughout my, my uh, career as an artist, there's always been moments that have kind of been those kind of markers. And definitely the very first marker is those, you know, those sketches of drawing animals and, and uh, uh, drawing my family and just kind of doodling. That's great. Are those, is that your work behind you? No, this is actually, this is actually my friend Guno Park, who actually is also another artist who works with Sugarlift. But I, I gotcha. love collecting art from, from my friends and other artists that I admire. So all the work in my, in my apartment is actually uh, none of mine. <laughs> I, I only hang out with friends. Work. Yeah. That is super interesting. So how would you, what, how would you categorize your work? What, um, what style? Would you oh, you know, that? we don't like categories. We don't like, <laughs> we don't like uh, <laughs> titles. No, no, no. I, I guess in a formal sense, you could say that my work is uh, figurative and representational art where it looks realistic or, um, but uh, I, I like to, uh, I mean, my work is, is central, is, is uh, the central idea of my work is this idea of inheritance. I grew up in the Midwest and uh, my family's from Mexico. So, uh, I grew up biculturally, and so I like to focus on um, I, I focus on that overlap of uh, my Mexican uh, family heritage and my Midwest Americana upbringing, and I try to find those overlaps that are sometimes dissonant and sometimes harmonious. And those are the kind of those overlaps are the moments that kind of uh, uh, that I that make who I am, and so. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I focus on on those kind of image. So that includes images that 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 would be um, uh, rural animals, rural landscapes. Uh, you know what I'm working on at the Highline Nine, uh, ballet, Mexican ballet for political dancers, and and images from the Midwest and uh, my family in Mexico. That's great. Um, well, thank you for that. I want to pivot to my favorite round, which is our fire round of questions, because I want to unpack a little bit more about each of you, um, besides sort of your professional, uh, just some fun questions that I want to throw out there for you each to answer. Um, <laughs> so I promise it's not scary, it's just a little fun. Um, so brunch or dinner out at a restaurant? Dinner. 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 Hannah, dan <laughs> dinner all around? Got it. I I'm, we're in total agreement. Mm -hmm. um, Portraits, landscapes, or still life in terms of uh, a favorite art? Portrait. Landscape. Still life was that? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Oh, so oh, mm. total differences. Um, I'm going to pronounce it 
Kehinde Wiley or Cindy Sherman um, in terms of an, totally different types of artists? I'm gonna have to say Kehinde Wiley. I am as well. I can only say my own name. <laughs> We're very I humble love here. It. Very humble Classic. here. Highlight yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll add you to my list. Um, <laughs> um, white wine or red wine? Ooh, seasonal. Right now I'm red, but once October, early October hits, red all the way. Gotcha. Unless it's sangria. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, I see you thinking a lot. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. It's summertime. I gotta go white. A crisp, mm -hmm. okay. You know, crisp glass of white wine. Nico, any wine preference? Sorry, my answer is really boring. I actually don't drink, and I've actually never That's had okay. alcohol before. Yeah. So, um, what are you? Uh, is it? Is it coffee? Is it? it what? <laughs> what's the go-to beverage? It's like water. Lemonade. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not picky. Anything. That's fine. That works. <laughs> um, okay. And then beach visit or park picnic? Park. Okay. Beach. Love the ocean. Just love it. Say beach also. Gotcha. Um, see, those weren't that scary. No. I feel like you guys were most nervous. <laughs> Except now I like want a glass of white wine on a beach, and that's not where no. I am, so it's upsetting. <laughs> and that's not going to happen today, that's no, for sure. No, certainly not. <laughs> um, well, is there anything else you guys want to share or add other than the fact that this was a wonderful conversation? I'm super happy um, to have be talking to you guys and figuring out this connection between your gallery and, and mm. meatpacking, and this is great. You know, I think the, the only thing is just now that we're speaking about wine and art um, and meatpacking district, I think, you know, every Thursday in August, our, our beautiful on-site Italian restaurant, El Piccolo Restoro, is going to be doing some, some drink specials. And our artists will be in their studios working late uh, every Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Highline 9. So we just invite everyone in meatpacking Chelsea everyone in this area to come get a drink, enjoy a meal, and then see the artists at work. That sounds fantastic. Uh, and if I didn't have reservations this Thursday already in the meatpacking <laughs> district, I'd be there this week. But I think I will be doing that next week for sure. Excellent. Um, so thrilled to hear it. Um, and really, thank you guys all for joining us today. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, and thanks everybody else for tuning in uh, to Meatpacking Unpacked. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned to hear more from the Meatpacking District and the city's cast of characters across the cultural, political, and business spectrums. See you all next week. <laughs>